Andrew Huberman's mechanisms of control, the private and public seductions of the world's biggest pop neuroscientist. I saw a bunch of media people talking about this like it was some big Me Too scandal, like there was a bunch of shameful, dirty secrets, and I assume there was something really dark and sinister here. It sounds like it's an attempt to say, hey, this guy isn't what you think he is. He's not so great. He's not such a great researcher. So I think the, the motives was, were, were clear. We are here uh, after much technical difficulties to bring you a uh, review, evaluation, discussion on the recent situation or hit piece or expose on uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman and his personal life. And we want to come at it from a couple angles. One in particular is what it means when your guru or role model or person you really look up to is exposed in certain ways, their personal life is brought out into the open. And uh, sometimes that can disrupt our views of these people or whatnot. And the other side of it perhaps is the mainstream media's attack on alternative media or other people that are getting really popular. And the uh, video we're going to look at is Glenn Greenwald, and he tends to be a bit of a person who likes to attack the mainstream media for various reasons. Uh, so we're not exactly sure what to expect from him. But uh, David, you got anything else to add here? Um, so maybe just a bit, tiny bit of background. Um, so Andrew Huberman, for those who don't know, so Mike, you and I, We've spoken about him on this podcast before on this channel. We'll occasionally listen to him. I don't think I've ever listened to a full three-hour podcast, um, but <laughs> but okay. So it was like moments here and there. Um, I think I've listened to something mainly on like you know the 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 science behind cold, deliberate cold exposure. I think that's probably maybe like the two-hour the most I've listened to him. But then there's other things about eating and and diet, um, eat, eating and diet, um, sunlight, morning routines stuff that comes up on my YouTube feed. So I guess he's part of my sort of information ecosystem the same way Mikey is for you. Like he's someone of many you think about, listen to. Um, he's, as a New York Magazine article mentions, he's like the like the most popular neuroscientist, but he's, all, he's not just that. They refer to him as a pop neuroscientist in the sort of like subheading of their title. But he's, uh, you know, a, a professor at Stanford. He runs a lab called the Huberman Lab. So he's quite well accomplished. He's published in peer review uh, journals. So he's like a, a traditional academic who also happens to be incredibly popular in terms of the mainstream. I think his goal is to provide accessible insights from scientific literatures, focused on specific kinds of questions like the effect of sunlight on one's health, the effect of, as I mentioned, deliberate cold exposure, exercise, alcohol. Um, I think he did stuff. something on like cell phones and fertility, you know, I think like uh, tons of ton, tons of topics just based on like what, okay. So like in terms of the framing, like what we want to do with that hit piece. So there's, there's a Glenn Greenwald approach, which is what does this tell us about mainstream media priorities? Like why is the New York magazine, which is a prominent journal uh, in sort of the U S uh, media space. Why is it devoting 8,000 words? It's cover story to this guy, you know, an editor clearly made a decision to put this on the front page. Why, why is that the case? What does that tell us about what the media cares about? What should that say to us about what the media ought to care about? Um, the other framing, Mike, this is something also you mentioned is let's just assume for the sake of this discussion that everything they say is, is right. What do we then do when confronted with uncomfortable information about someone we might go to as a source of insight to how we ought to, you know, how we can be better people, nicer, more compassionate, stronger, healthier, all those things. So I think like, let me just raise the question of an audible. We wanted to talk about Greenwald. Greenwald is going to be like, why, what, what is this some kind of, like he's very critical of the mainstream media on, on, on every front. And he's using this as a, as a launching pad to say like, why, why do they care so much about this guy? Um, especially when the, the article itself doesn't question any of his, health practices or his, his advice or his insights. It's more about more about his personal life. Um, so we can take that angle or you and I can just have a, a conversation about like, what do we, it's up to you. What do we do? Like, okay, do we want to go the the Greenwald media priorities, culture war stuff that you mentioned, or do we want to talk more about, um, yeah, like what do you, what do you do when, when someone you, you might respect, maybe you don't know them at all other than an online personality 
But like, what do you do when confronted with this kind of information that might make you feel uncomfortable? Should you ignore it? Uh, if so, why? If you should not ignore it, does that mean, you know, what does that mean for how you, had, how you use the information they provide on your own life? Should you care? Should you not care? Maybe that second approach is a bit more relevant for, for us. But Mike, what do you, what do you think? Maybe we don't need Greenwald as much as we think now that I, now that I think about it, but we can also play that and sort of use that as a bit of a launching pad. So what's interesting for you, Me, the media priority stuff or the gurus, what do you do when confronted with sort of like the reality of the, the flaws of their existence and their humanity? What's interesting for you? Yeah, let's go with the guru side of things. But okay. Let's just listen to what Glenn has to say and then we'll go from there. All right, for our last story, I want to talk about a New York Times, a New York Magazine cover story on someone named Andrew Huberman. Now, what I saw though was a bunch of media people today promoting a story, a cover story that is on New York Magazine. His face appears on New York Magazine. And here you see it on the screen, Andrew Huberman's Mechanisms of Control, the private and public seductions of the world's biggest pop neuroscientist. And it's written by a New York Magazine journalist named Kerry Holly. I saw a bunch of media people talking about this like it was some big Me Too scandal, like there was a bunch of shameful, dirty secrets, and I assume there was something really dark and sinister here. And the more I began reading it, I kept reading it. It went on and on and on and on and on. It was this endless article, and it was basically nothing other than reporting on his adult dating life. He's a 48-year-old man. He is very focused on fitness. He's very big, he's very muscular, conventionally handsome. A lot of women find him handsome. That's part of his appeal. It's the reason why a lot of people listen to him. And he's unmarried, he's a bachelor, he's wealthy, he's a neuroscientist. And this article didn't do any, it tried to destroy his reputation. You can see here it's framed his mechanisms of control. So you assume it's some kind of like article about his abuse with women, his misogynistic network of, of women that he's manipulated and abused non-consensually. That's what you're expecting and you're reading it and you're reading it. And it's just basically nothing other than a report interviewing women that he's is dating and still has dating. And I guess the worst thing that they found out about him was that he was dating women who didn't realize he had other girlfriends at the same time. He wasn't married to any of them. And that's it. So for those who've read it, you know, it is, it is an interesting read. I think there's, there's sort of three main arguments the journalist, the, the author is making against Huberman. One, his lab is non-existent. So he presents himself as this like high profile researcher, cutting edge researcher at Stanford. He runs this lab with PhD students and postdocs and colleagues and et cetera, et cetera. But the journalist suggests that it's not really a real thing. Um, it's not as robust and active as Huberman suggests it is. Not a ton of evidence to support it one way or the other, but that's mentioned. The second is she's very critical of this AG1 product that he promotes. Um, athletic greens, which is sort of like a green powder that that has become quite popular, said to provide like foundational nutritional support to those who, who use it. She says there's all these critics of it and it's not as effective. It's sort of like a, a bogus product, bogus health product in a re relatively unregulated industry. The third claim, which is the most important, or sorry, the, the one that the, the, the author talks about the most substantively is Huberman's relationship with, I think, five or six girlfriends where he's not been as honest with these people about monogamy, about commitment. Um, he's scheduling different people, chatting with different girl women at the same time, not as trustworthy, not as reliable as the partner, things like that. So I think that's where that's where a lot of the the hit job stuff comes in, where it's sort of a, a detailed overview of Huberman's private romantic life and the relationships with these with these five or six women who have now organized, they have their own text chains or, or WhatsApp groups. What's up? I never know how to say it. Uh, WhatsApp, um, where they sort of express their, their frustrations and they share and they have all the solidarity around um, the, the, the negative experiences they, they felt um, through the relationships with, with Huberman. Um, so those three pieces together, Mike, I want to get your thoughts on this. Those three pieces together suggest that one, he's not as grave an academic as you might think he is because he's the Stanford lab he has isn't so 
uh, great. The Athletic Greens product is a bunch of BS, like so many other supposedly health products out there that are said to be, you know, really healthy. It's just, you know, marketing and, you know, exploitation of unknowledgeable audiences who are very vulnerable to, you know, anything being sold by high profile professors and academics. And then the third is he's not a particularly stand up guy in terms of his honesty and in terms of his uh, commitment to being, you know, tr- faithful and truthful to those, especially in, in the context of, of romantic relationships where things can be quite sensitive. So those put together, assuming it's true, suggest that maybe we, this isn't a guy we should not talk about in the future on this podcast. We shouldn't go to. Yeah, what what do you did think? they conclude about that in the end? Did they about su- which? Does the author suggest that you should not take this guy seriously or so, what? So it's a, it's a good question because one thing, um, that perhaps is the most frustrating about the piece um, is there's not, you don't get, it's not, it's, I don't think the, the journalist takes this one in one direction or the other. It's the, the insinuation is he's not reliable. Like don't, you know, here's this pop neuroscientist, but he's, a, he's, he's a jerk and he's not right, as great as you right. think. Um, the thing that perhaps is, is frustrating about the piece uh, when thinking about it from the perspective of do we refer, go to him for health insight, maybe not insight into how to manage a relationship or romance and all that other stuff, but should we go to him? There's, there's almost no engagement with his scientific findings, right? Or his reviews of scientific literatures. Nothing about, doesn't critique his view of his morning routine, doesn't critique his perspectives on on how to work out efficiently, he doesn't critique his perspectives on eating um, and other things he talks about. You know. So, I so it's, it's it remains an open question. It doesn't. She doesn't tell us one way or the other. So maybe if it was a, a really critical piece of all the things he was saying, or at least a major things piece, you know, health health advice pieces he was providing and saying there's actually no basis for some of these things, that would make it a bit more of a scholarly endeavor and make us question whether he's a reliable source, but because it's so personal, maybe, maybe less so. Uh, what do you, what do you think? How did, you, based on the commentary you've seen of this piece, what do you, what do you feel about it? Have you seen situ? have you been in situations where a guru of yours or someone you've gone to has been actually, I guess, quote unquote, exposed as a flawed human being? Yeah. Um, a couple of thoughts are coming up. One is, yeah, what are the motives of this person and this piece and why are they writing it and why are they going after him in his personal life? very curious maybe it's just because he's so popular and you know i guess journalists are you know it is their job to kind of expose people right or learn about the world and help the rest of us understand the world so maybe there's some genuine exploration there who knows uh i think this is a topic that i hear sam harris speak about often in terms of the gurus of the um buddhist mindfulness teaching and and sort of the separation between their skillfulness as teachers and their wisdom in terms of communicating insights into the nature of mind, the nature of our well-being, et cetera, versus their personal escapades and their personal failings and et cetera. And so I kind of agree in the sense that you can separate for Huberman, let's say we can separate his intelligence, his effectiveness at knowledge translation, the wonderful gifts really that he's been sharing with the world, like a lot of good insights. He's putting out tons of good free information. That's super useful for lots of people and nobody's perfect. So I kind of, I think we need to learn to be able to separate different parts of people, understand that people are flawed. Uh, Nobody's perfect. Certainly Andrew Huberman is not perfect either. And that's okay, I guess. Really, it just depends on what your tolerance level is for different types of behavior. You know, a question might be, uh, think about famous people like Madonna or I don't know too much about Angelina Jolie, but clearly Madonna's had very many sexual escapades and different relationships with people and all kinds of potentially questionable behavior, right? So do we judge her as a bad singer because she does that? You know, or, I mean, that's as true for so many different people. So maybe, maybe not. I don't know. There's a great, I think it's on Netflix. It's a Tony Robbins, who's another huge guru in the personal development space. He has, there's a documentary called I Am Not Your Guru. And so in that documentary, from what I remember, he kind of separates the teachings from the person, 
right? So we can, we don't want to fall in love with, right? Or revere these people to an extent where we idolize them because they're human beings too. And they're not perfect. What we're trying to do is take away the teachings and implement them in our lives. And if they're helpful, great. And, you know, just because Andrew Huberman has maybe questionable or dishonest romantic affairs doesn't mean that he's not a good neuroscientist. It doesn't mean that the information he's sharing isn't true or isn't helpful. I mean, maybe you could assume that, right? If he's dishonest in this area of his life, then maybe he's dishonest in others. And maybe that's true. I don't know. So maybe there's an incongruence in him and maybe his motives are worthy of being questioned in particular with the athletic greens thing, right? So yeah, maybe his motives aren't so pure. Maybe he's bending the truth a little bit. Who knows? Who knows? I don't know. So, okay. So three main points you're making, you're making Mike. Um, one is the motivation of this journalist. Yeah. Um, two is separating out different aspects of one's life. So those that we see as influential sort of separate out their teachings from just the day-to-day person they are, what they do. And then three, this raises an interesting question is if it's a, or if you lie in one domain of your life, should we as vulnerable consumers um, of insight from that person, then assume that you're also lying in other domains of your life. So there's three interesting things there. So the motive of the journalist, it, clearly it must have been to get people to stop listening to this guy. Right? I think. Something like an like attack that. on I do what, wanna, yeah. just Just one quick thing yeah. between separating the sort of personal life from the skillful teachings. Do you want to go through each, each three? Yeah, just... Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, okay, so, but so you, the, the motives of the journal. It sounds like it sounds like it's an attempt to say, "Hey, this guy isn't what you think he is. He's not so yeah, great. Yeah, He's not yeah, such a great yeah. researcher." So I think the the motives was, were, were clear. It doesn't sound like uh, the case you're making. This is the second point we'll get to right now, which is here's this really amazing, influential thinker. He's done some some questionable things that everyone can have different opinions on, but on the whole. He's so important for our society because um, he provides really meaningful, free healthcare advice um, for you know for a generally sick population. We don't we're not as healthy as we should be in many ways, and he provides a really important service. So she's not making that argument. She doesn't go there. I think at, at least from what I remember. And correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. If she says still listen to him, I don't think she says that at all. So yeah. So what were you going to say about separating out? teachings from personality sort of traits, character traits. Yeah. I, I just was sort of going to clarify that if the person is really out there doing very harmful, terrible things, that's a bit different than, you know, having difficulty in your romantic life. So he has difficulty in his romantic life or being honest with women or who knows whatever it is. That's different than if he's abusing women or committing crimes or, you know, falsifying research. So, so yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So the falsifying research, let's say the allegations against Huberman were like, he, he, he physically abused these women. Yes. Yes. Should that, so the severity you're saying the severity of the personality trait should influence the extent to which we go back to those teachings. Now, I wonder why, why do you think that's the case? Let's say he did, let's say all this stuff is true in the article and worse. Why does that, in, why should that influence how we view, how we listen to his podcast and whether we adopt his morning routines and, and other things that he suggests we do? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think, so perhaps it's maybe the teachings are still valid, and the information he's sharing is still valid, whether or not you want to continue supporting somebody like that mm. is mm. maybe what I'm, what I was alluding to. Right. So if it turns out this guy is a real asshole and a sh you know, shitty human being, then maybe we don't need to support him anymore and don't need to follow him anymore. It doesn't necessarily mean that his advice or guidance isn't helpful. So maybe that's the d distinguishing factor there. Right. Okay. Um, what about, so you made a really good point. The third point you made was about lying. The charge against Huberman, which of course is, has not been proven in a court of law. We only have one side. We don't hear him. He spoke, he's represented through his spokesperson in the article. So he doesn't agree to talk to the journalist. There's, a, I think, a personal spokesperson or maybe a Stanford spokesperson 
who comments on certain things and challenges some of the claims made by his the the sort of romantic partners that are very critical of his behavior. So there's clearly a dispute. But the allegation is that he's he's a liar in his personal Got life. It. One can lie about, you know, their commitment to someone else. Someone can also lie about the science, right? Like they can misrepresent findings, they can cherry pick certain studies and ignore others. They can f- totally fabricate as you mentioned. So do you think in this case Huberman's the fact that he's said to be a liar does that raise questions about his what we should be we assume he's providing us with accurate information that's as objective and honest as he possibly can provide it but he, now he's said to be a liar very charming but a liar <laughs> does that mean his science is his reviews of certain bodies of literature are fabricated or not as honest as we might think they are is that a fair assumption that's a really good question. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, right? Um, I think it's, we don't have really his side of the story here. And when people are emotionally dysregulated or angry or they've had their hearts broken or, you know, we don't know what the motives of these women are either that are commenting on all of this. So it seems to be so much hearsay or whatever. And, and clearly he's got some pattern of behavior, right? Or this wouldn't have come out in any way, right? Maybe it's a conspiracy, who knows? But going back to this idea of lying and, you know, if you can be deceptive in one area of your life, what does that look like in other areas? I don't know if there's a blanket statement to that. I know for me personally, as a, when I was a drug addict, I was just lying about everything. So, but that was more, I think, as just a matter of being disconnected from my own reality and, and, it was more of an inability to be honest. Like I don't even actually think I knew what that really was because everything was sort of a ploy. Everything was a, like a maneuver to get through life in some way kind of idea. So I was kind of living in a fantasy lie. And so for me, once that bubble burst, to me, I think I do a good job. I'm not perfect. I'm sure there's things. Uh, but for me, I have to be honest in all of my affairs. So it's not okay to lie or bend the truth about anything. Um, and I'm sure I don't do a perfect job of that, but I think I do a pretty good job. So I don't know. I, I don't think I could lie. So for me now, if I was lying about one thing, it would haunt me because for me, it's about despair and hopelessness. And if I start lying, then I'm just on a, a fast track to misery and addiction probably. So I'm a bit of a maybe unique case where it really is pretty rigid for me, but that's because it's my own sanity. But I do think it's hard, you know, we have a sort of negativity bias. So when people do sort of display undesired behavior, you can't help but be suspicious about their other domains of life. And so he has had such a untarnished image for many years, right? He's been what are they squeaky clean? Um, and maybe he's just a human being. I don't know. It, it just, these are things to, to contemplate. I don't think it's helpful to be too rigid about certain things, but I do think I'm a bit more of the paranoid type, right? So I may be a little bit neurotic, neurotic like that, where you show me uh, bad behavior here, then I, I can't help but suspect that you probably are doing it in other areas of your life. So I don't know. It's such a good point. So it's like hard to earn, hard to earn a good reputation, easy to develop a bad one. Yeah, like one yeah, yeah. screw or, up, yeah, one fuck yeah, up, yeah. one lie, you're a liar. I was wondering, so I, Mike, I didn't know you when you were struggling with addiction. I met you after. Mm-hmm. Um, giving me advice now, if I were to meet your former self, you were, you said you're lying about everything, but let's say like, uh, you know, I, I came to you as a problem. I've been struggling with, you know, with, with something career wise, relationship, family. Would you tell me now, no, don't trust, like, don't trust that person. Like don't go to for, former Mike, addict Mike. Yeah. You were a liar about a lot of things, but like, maybe there's some things I could, I could rely upon. Like, would you give me, would you say, go to your former self for emotional support through a tough time I might be going through? Or no, are you totally just not 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 a, yeah, yeah. not productive I, for anyone? <laughs> I tend not to think thought experiments are effective. I know they're used in philosophy all the time and 
It get, the reason I ask, sorry, the reason yeah. I ask is I, I do wonder, so you have, so in, in some states, in some cases, because of your struggles, you're just lying constantly. Yes. And I'm wondering if that had sort of means for everyone around you, you were not someone anyone should have gone to. But I, I know you. Now, I'm sure the addiction changed you, but I'm sure at some, you know, in some ways, your essence was the same. You're reliable, yes. you're thoughtful, you're compassionate. That stuff must have been there. That stuff isn't just developed in your 30s. Were you, just because you were lying in so much in your life through addiction, does that mean everyone around you should have said, okay, yeah, I'm not taking advice from this guy because he's lying in you know, 90% of his other things he's doing? It's a good question. And I guess it maps onto the Huberman thing a little bit, right? right. Um, I think it depends on what it is I'm being asked. Right, uh, okay. I was reliable in certain contexts. And yes, I was a compassionate sort of understanding. I loved people. I wanted to be nice and kind and helpful. I think it was sort of when certain areas of my life were in front of my face, I couldn't be honest. And it was mostly about like, I lied mostly to myself and I slowly pushed people away so that I didn't have to lie to them. I sort of kind of had a a little bit of a shield around me where don't let anyone too close because I don't know how to deal with that and I will lie. Kind and of they may idea. find out the truth about you. Something like that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So that's a, I don't know. I, I, I would not, <laughs> if I had options, I certainly probably would suggest people go to other people for <laughs> advice rather than right. me first. Uh, but I could be reliable. Like I would, if people asked me to sort of do something or, uh, you know, I was pretty loyal to my friends and that kind of idea. But right. if it ever got really tough and I had to, put their needs in front of mine, right? Or if I had to confront some of my challenges, I don't know what would have happened, you know? So I, in, in the Huberman case, I mean, Mike, that's super interesting. Um, in the Huberman case, I wonder about the relationship between, like the, the Huberman that you and I would be exposed to is Andrew, yep. the scientist. In that situation, the, the, the other character we're, we can be confronted with in this article is Andrew, the or Huberman, the, um, the boyfriend, the partner. Mm-hmm. And so he might he might have reasons to lie in one domain and reasons not to lie in another. So you might want to lie in your romantic life because you're not sure if, if you don't want to hurt someone's feelings. You don't sure if you're you know you don't want to commit to them. You have other sort of like traumas in your past that that shape your family values and how you want to live your life and the extent to what you want you want to devote yourself to other people. He might have a whole host of reasons to lie in that domain, right? But does he have incentives to lie? on his podcast about sunlight, about mornings, about exercise, about diet. It doesn't sound like, it doesn't feel like that's obvious, right? Like if his academic career rests on his ability to describe this material, you know, fairly, then I don't, there, there seems to be a disincentive to be dishonest and an incentive for us to trust him. So if he like, so the point I'm making is that it seems to be like two different domains that they're not clearly connected. If he was, if he was in a relation, if this New York, if this article said Huberman is in a relationship and lying about his credentials, lying about his research, lying about his the re, you know some of the pro the papers he's written or not written has fabricated data and he's telling these women and these women are then coming out saying actually he's not the researcher we thought he was be then maybe I'd be like yeah okay maybe this podcast is problematic yeah but if it's just like you know maybe not the mo the healthiest way of dealing with relationship issues that seems to be so disconnected from what he's doing on his podcast. Maybe in those situations when the guru's be personal life it seems to be very different from their teachings, um, then in that situation, we can still go to that guru for insight when there's a lot of overlap between the two. So if he was lying to women about his research and his... right. Then that would be then okay yeah then then okay that lie maps onto the other lies he might be telling us like if he's lying to them he's probably lying to us but he's not in a romantic relationship with us he's not asking us to commit with to him we're not asking anything of him we're just listening to him about re reviews of scientific literature so in that sense maybe the the behaviors are so different that it shouldn't affect our our view of him assuming everything in the New York magazine stuff article is true and we don't know if it is true. Uh this is such a great question i think um one one thing for a future discussion yes is gad sad talks about two different forms of truth 
can't remember ontological and deontological or some shit like that. Okay. Um, where he sort of argues that sometimes it's okay to lie, right? Yeah. Where he says yeah. it's okay to tell someone they look good in their outfit when you don't think they do. And I'm right. on, and and I think that's stupid. That's ridiculous. How could you? He, he claims to be someone who's so about the truth and free speech and blah blah blah, and then yet he's making the argument that sometimes it's okay to lie about certain things. And I think that's ridiculous. I'm much more on the Sam Harris side of things. Of lying is just never good. And again, I have bias because lying almost destroyed my life, or did in some ways, nearly destroyed my life. And. So for me, it's not an option. And to me, it's way easier to live my life when I'm being honest. You don't have things to hide. You're not paranoid that you're going to say the wrong thing or you have to play this double life. And so maybe I'm biased in this way of, of you know, there probably is a there there in some sense with Huberman around this stuff. I don't mm. know. Maybe that's not fair. It's probably not fair. But maybe there's a there there in terms of where does the dishonesty play out in other areas of his life? Who knows? Um, there was one other thing. So like the Greek philosopher, the Asian Greek philosopher Plato spoke about this noble lie, the noble lie of telling society something that could bind them together, that could be productive. So it was a falsehood, but something that the people could believe in so they would be willing to sacrifice for one another and make society more robust. Yeah, no. But, but um because without that, things fall apart. Things go again into chaos and anarchy, and that's horrible. So in, in your case as a therapist, let's end with this question. Okay. Is there ever a reason to tell someone, and it may not be a falsehood in the sense that you know it's not going to be true, but you're not sure if it's true or not, which could be sort of a lie. You're like, you're not as bad as you think. You're going to do great. Um, you have a pathway to recovery. I have faith in you that you could get over this. You might not believe in any of those statements, but you have to tell that person those things so they start to believe it. So you're telling a, a lie in some ways. Like, is there ever a case for lying to a to a student, to a to a to a patient of yours to get them to move forward on their on their pathway to recovery? If you're so brutally honest, maybe they're like, "Yeah, I am really fucked up, and there's no way I'm getting out of this." And yeah. my therapist won't even tell me I'm doing great. <laughs> My, where do you think? Where do you stand? No, on I don't think there's ever. I, I again, one one of the things that Sam Harris points out, which I agree with, is when it's to protect someone's safety from harm. So if someone knocked on this door and said to me, "Is David Zarnett in there? I want to kill him." Yeah, I would say no. Oh, okay. So in that case, I would lie. okay, okay. And in the twelve step program, and this is a spiritual principle, they say. Uh, may direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. So sometimes, and this is more about digging up the past. So we don't need to dig up the past all the time and tell people all the bad things we've done, because that's just going to cause shit that's unnecessary. Right. Okay. If it's, so say for Huberman, say he has some uh, spiritual experience where he's like, I'm never going to lie to a woman ever again. If he maintains that and he doesn't lie ever again, mm -hmm. then the argument is there's no point going back to all the women you did lie to and, and confessing all them, right. all those lies. Just leave it. Just let it go. It's not going to do anyone any good. Mm. Although if you continue to lie, then you need to stop doing that and admit your faults. So in that it's a, that's a little bit more of a retrospective honesty and, and so then, you know, in terms of the present moment thing, no, I don't think lying serves anyone ever. I really don't. But it's, it does because it, it just protected me from death. Yeah. So in that case, yes. But in terms of what about lying jail? to what a What if they said, I'm not going to kill him, but I'm going to take him to jail? If what do you, you did a crime? What, you, you have no idea. We're just friends. and Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to kill him. I'm just going to punch him in the face. Like, <laughs> you just what, at what point? Yeah, I would. Or I'm gonna I'm gonna be so mean to him. It's a student at, at the door and saying I'm gonna be so mean to him about yeah. his teaching ability, and I have to yell at him about the lecture he gave last night in class. Yeah, one thing I would might say is that? yeah, maybe, but I would probably be honest. I would be like, yeah, he's here, but I'm not letting you in right now. We're busy. You can talk to him later. Okay. Something like that. Okay. I just think there's we need to learn to deal with the world as it is, and so which goes to this whole free speech, being truthful, all this stuff. So it's never, you know, the, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, all that stuff. Like, I don't think it's ever justifiable to lie in, in context other than when we're trying to protect someone's safety 
or we're digging up things from the past that will serve nobody. And it's more of an ego gratification thing to free yourself from your own guilt as opposed to be of service. But you mean physical safety, not psychological safety. Yeah, maybe psychological safety, depending on the nature of the right. beast. We should continue okay. this next time. But um, Okay, so yeah, the everybody. ethics of lying. It's a big yeah. It's a big topic. Maybe we'll get into the Gadsad Dion yeah. crap or whatever. That sounds great. Okay, thank you, Mike. All right, buddy. Thank you. Bye, everybody. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content. And otherwise, have a great day. Peace out.